I really love the, um, the graphic that Matt put together for our sermon. M Mike, you're Mike, that's Matt. That Mike put together for our sermon. Uh, so, one of the things I love about church is the church calendar, which makes me a super church nerd, just in case you're wondering. I love that the church calendar calls us to follow seasons that are different from the secular world. For instance, before Christmas, we are called to live into the season of Advent, four weeks that call us to a time of preparation, a time when we are to clean the houses of our spiritual lives to make sure that we're ready for Christ's coming. We celebrate the birth of Christ, not just on Christmas, but for the days, the 12 days of Christmas after Christmas, a season of feasting and celebration. We leave Christmas tide and go into what we call ordinary time, a season of the church calendar that comes and goes all year long in between seasons of fasting and feasting. And this week, we've left ordinary time for a new season, the 40 days of Lent. When I first met Dwight, um, he uh, said the word Lent with a southern draw, so it sounded more like Lent than Lent. And, um, and he uh, grew up in a non-liturgical church, in a Southern Baptist church, and they didn't do, uh, they don't really follow the church um, season the same way that Methodist church does. And so he didn't know anything about Lent. So I had to explain to him that it was something different than the stuff that you find in the pocket, you know, like in the corner of the pocket of your jeans. It wasn't Lent, it was Lent, it's different. Lent is 40 days. In biblical language, that means a really long time. Noah and his family spent 40 days in the ark, 40 days and nights of being tossed about on a sea that engulfed the whole world. The Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness, wandering along, waiting to find the promised land. 40 years that changed their lives and their children's lives and their children's children's lives. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days, during which time he received the Ten Commandments. His time spent with God changed the lives of the Israelite people as it gave them order and a purpose and formed the covenant by which they live and by which we live. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert before he began his public ministry being tempted by Satan. All of these were seasons of preparation that changed the lives of people afterwards. And after all of them, a covenant was made that changed the lives of those involved and of those around them. So together, we are entering just this kind of season. And we're going to use this season as a church to do some hard learning. We're going to spend the next six weeks of Lent talking together about some of the harder sayings of Jesus. Really, I think if we try to live them all out, most of the things that Jesus said are hard. But there are some that I find in Scripture, especially on first hearing, that are particularly difficult. Some that seem not to make sense and some which can even feel contradictory to other things that Jesus had said. And there are some, like a part of today's reading, that cause a visceral, physical response when we read or hear them. And so we're going to spend the next six weeks talking about those kinds of things from Scripture. A few days ago, we began the season of Lent with an Ash Wednesday service. At that service, we read from the prophet Joel, who encouraged us to rend our hearts and not our clothing. With this passage from Luke that Rob read for us this morning, Jesus seems to be doing just that. His words tell us to hate our family. And hearing that the first time can really be heart-rending. And it doesn't seem to make sense to us when we first read it. It is passages like this one that I think when we read it makes it difficult to say afterward, this is the word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Because you don't want to say thanks be to God to Jesus telling you to hate your family. It just feels kind of weird. We are accustomed to hearing Jesus tell us to love people, even love our enemies. So when we read this, we have to ask ourselves, does Jesus really want us to love our enemies but hate those who are most dear to us? In order to understand the statements that Jesus makes, I think we have to look at the whole passage. When we do so, we'll see that really it's all about a call to discipleship. Each thing that Jesus mentions in this passage is about the high price of following him. What the disciples will have to give up if they take seriously this call to follow Jesus. 
Jesus wants those who choose to follow him to know that following this path comes at a cost. It will not be an easy one, or as my friend says, following Jesus ain't no cakewalk. Being a disciple of Jesus is demanding. It requires a lot, and Jesus wants the disciples to know just what they're getting into. Jesus goes on to say in the passage, you wouldn't begin other large undertakings like building a building or starting a war without first figuring out if you are willing to pay the price. He wants them to really think about what's involved in following him and then decide if they are willing to pay the cost that he's asking. I've often thought that I would like to live on a farm. There's something about that which seems very appealing to me. The wide open spaces, the working the land, the caring for the cute livestock that are around. I think um, maybe I read too many of the Laura Ingalls Wilder books when I was little because I even fell in love with the idea of churning my own butter. I thought that that sounded really fun. She made it sound really fun. But then I remember things like, I don't even like mowing the lawn. In fact, I'm allergic to cut grass, so I like the idea of living on a farm, but I want the romanticized movie version of living on a farm. I want the version where you pick a few, me um, few vegetables for your meal that day, where you have the really great view and you can pet and ride the horses and in the evening you sit on the rocking chair drinking a glass of lemonade on your front porch. That's the kind of farm living I want. But a real farm isn't anything like that. It's long hours and physically demanding work and there's never a day off. I like the idea of a farm, but not the reality of a farm. Now, apparently, I'm not the only one who likes the idea of farm living better than the reality. In Ottawa County, Michigan, a rural farming community, many new homeowners were moving into the area. These folks were looking for a little bit more space and a little bit less crowding than the suburbs and cities that they were leaving. The problem was that these new homeowners did not like the sounds and smells of the working farms next door to them. So they began to complain to the county and even filed lawsuits against the farms for things like using agricultural equipment early in the morning and late into the evening, which, you know, annoyed them, and spreading pesticide and fertilizer and the smell of the manure. Can you imagine fire, filing a lawsuit about the smell of the manure coming from your neighbors? I just, I, I couldn't even imagine. So Ottawa County, Michigan decided to do something about that. They created a brochure for potential new homeowners. It explained the rights of the working farmers around them, and it even included a scratch and sniff portion for those not familiar with the smell of manure. If you don't believe me, I have the link to the brochure, which you can check out. It's true. Ottawa County decided to do something that other people thought was ridiculous because they wanted people to know the full cost of living in this farming community before people made the decision to buy a house in it. Likewise, Jesus wants his would-be disciples to know the full cost of following him. The Gospel of Luke tells us it was a large crowd following Jesus that day. One, one version of it calls it a multitude of people. And Jesus wanted all of those people who were with him, who were following him, all of those who liked the idea of being his disciples, to know just how demanding following him will be. Because not everyone was going to be able to do this thing that Jesus was calling them to do. The cost, he tells them, is everything that we hold near and dear your family, yourself, your life, and your possessions. Jesus says that being a disciple of him means that everything else, everything else must come second. A disciple puts Jesus and the kingdom of God first, period. That being said, the question I have to ask is, is Jesus really saying that he wants us to hate our families? Because that's the word that is used. You have to hate your mother and father, your brother and sister, he says. If what he's saying is true, then that goes against other things he said, like in Mark 10, 19, or Matthew 19, 19, or Luke 18, 20, where Jesus makes it clear that he holds up the commandment to honor one's mother and father and ex as an example of a life of obedience, which is necessary, he says, to inherit eternal life. In the Mark version of that passage, the man comes to him and asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response is, you know the commandments. You shouldn't murder, you shouldn't commit adultery, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't bear false witness, you shouldn't defraud people, honor your father and mother. 
So which is it? Are we to honor our father and mother or to hate them? Well, I think we have to know a few things about this passage from Luke, which help us to really see that Jesus isn't contradicting himself. The first thing we have to look at is the language that he uses. In our passage this morning, the English translation uses the word hate. My mother, who's here today, and I forgot you were going to be here when I talked about you in the sermon, so I apologize. My mother has always been against us using that word. She would correct us when we used it. So um, specifically in regards to other people, she would not allow us to say that we hated somebody. She was very quick to correct that. But also in regards to other things. So like if one of us would say, I hate that soup, her response was, really? Do you really hate that soup? You, she would tell us that we are allowed to dislike things, but we were not allowed to hate things. The hate that we know isn't what Jesus is saying either. He isn't saying you should love me and hate everyone else. Rather, the language he's using is a ranking language. He's saying you should love me more than you love anything else. This passage also appears in the Gospel of Matthew, and in Matthew's version, it gives us a really big clue that this is true in the language he's using, because it actually adds in the words, more than me. He says, you should love me more. There's another passage where Luke uses this same kind of language of love and hate, and in both passages, the language is both relational and relative. In other words, the language that Jesus uses to love one person less than the other is to hate him or her. You can think of it as a lesser love. We all have them, if we're, if we're uh, speaking truth to ourselves, right? We have things that we love love and things that we only love. And as much as we don't like to admit it, there is a hierarchy to our love, to our passion, both for people and for things. Albert Einstein, I think, is a great example of this. He was consumed by his passion for astrophysics. A theologian and pastor named John T. Carroll describes having been at Princeton Seminary at the same time that Einstein was there. And he said, anyone at Princeton during the 30s, 40s, or 50s, when Einstein was, could never forget seeing him walk around the campus daily in a turtleneck sweater, gray baggy pants, and plain slippers with his long gray hair flowing in the direction of the wind. He said Einstein would respond to greetings with a humble nod or a word, but it was always very clear that he was focused on something else, that his mind was somewhere else. Einstein loved music, and he played the violin beautifully. It gave him moments of relaxation, but his love of music did not have the same kind of of all-consuming passion that his love for astrophysics did. Carroll describes it this way. He said he lived his days in a world of mysterious handwritten mathematical symbols and figures bent on finding the unifying principle of matter and energy, speed, and space. The world will never be the same because his devotion to that search made all else a lesser love. Now here's the other thing about the statement that Jesus makes. Jesus is using hyperbole. Think about what you learned in English class a long time ago. Hyperbole is an exaggeration or a claim not meant to be taken literally. We use them all the time without really thinking about it. Like when your lunch is taking a really long time to get there and you say, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. You don't mean for your friends to take that literally, right? It's hyperbole. Hating family, hating your father and mother, your brother and sister, is Jesus using hyperbole. And we use hyperbole when we want to get attention. When you say, I'm hungry enough to get a horse, you want the people with you to know that you are really, really hungry. Jesus wanted this statement to catch attention. It is meant to shock the system. I think really a lot of what Jesus says is meant to shock the system. It's meant to shock us out of old patterns and behaviors. You see, Jesus has to replace our old way of life with something entirely new, and that's what statements like this do. They help to give us a new vision, and sometimes we have a tendency to cling to the old vision, the old way of seeing and discerning and valuing with our stubborn little hands, and so he must pry that away from us. In a way, he has to attack the world that we have allowed to define us, the life that we love so much in order to give us a new life. He challenges our familiar and comfortable world, and he can only succeed in doing that by making exaggerated claims that make us take a second look, that make us listen a second and third time by painting extreme images so that the system is shocked once more. 
There were in some ways some very unhealthy things going on with the system both then and now, even in how we think about family. Back then, the family system had a few things going on that detracted from what Jesus was calling the disciples to do. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think we can say the same is true today. Think back to a while ago when we did the sermon series on the seven deadly sins. We talked about how the common thing linking all seven of them was idolatry, idols being anything that we put above God. So um, that could be food in gluttony or money in greed. And sometimes our family can become an idol too. A few years ago, I read an article that talked about how parenting in America has become its own religion. The author was arguing that our society has placed caring for our children as the highest priority. And while that may seem like a good thing at first glance, in reality it's not. Always putting our children first creates its own set of problems. Once children leave the home, empty nesters sometimes find they don't know each other anymore and marriages end in divorce. Our children that we have sacrificed so much for have a rather rude awakening when they realize the rest of the world doesn't revolve around them and their needs. In addition to that, acting as if children are more valuable than adults, we perpetuate the mentality that the older you get, the less valuable your life is. After all, it's not at all uncommon to see little signs hanging in car windows saying baby on board, but you don't often see too many signs saying middle-aged man on board, or my grandfather's in the car with me, right? You don't see those. Now, by now, all of us parents probably wish we had worn steel-toed boots this morning because Jesus, as he does, steps over all of our toes. Now, Jesus isn't saying that we shouldn't care about our families, but Jesus is saying that our families shouldn't come first. And that is a hard thing for us to hear in our lives today. Jesus is saying that God's rule demands ultimate commitment. And if this commitment clashes with any other thing, no matter how important those things are, then that other allegiance has to give way. Jesus' hard saying about hating our parents is a call to examine and reorder our commitments, our most important relationships, in view of the supreme claim that God has upon our lives. And here's the thing. Jesus himself knew what this was like. He knew what it was like to have to reorder family relationships in order to put God's call first. Scripture tells us that his family at one point said Jesus was out of his mind, Mark 3, 21, and they went out to restrain him because of the things he was saying. When Jesus was 12, he chose to stay in the temple instead of with his parents, and when his mother asked him why he was there, he said, I must be about my father's business. Can you imagine hearing that as a mother? I'm sure Mary was proud of her son, but I'm sure it also probably hurt a little. And Jesus knew that. But Jesus also knew that our call to follow God's command in our lives is going to mean that to truly love our children, our spouse, our parents, can only be done only when we love them in and through our love for Christ. And we do that in big and small ways. Think of the mother who turns her daughter into the police for stealing or the father who checks his son into rehab. I'm sure we could all come up with examples of times our parents have called us to account and we hated them for it, only realizing in retrospect that by doing so, they were truly loving us. Jesus' call to love God above our family is also lived out in real physical ways, both then and now. He was calling the disciples to a journey of the heart, but also to a physical journey as they left their families to follow him around in his ministry. Following Jesus meant literally leaving family behind, leaving your job and your home. And that was true for the early church as well, as the apostles and teachers and leaders left home to spread the good news around the world. It's true for many pastors today who live apart from extended family in order to serve their commitments to God and the church. It's true for missionaries who leave their homes, sometimes with families, sometimes without. And it's also true for the non-preachers and missionaries, disciples, all of us as well. Sometimes we are asked to give up time with family in order to serve God and the people that God calls us to love. And here's the thing. In loving God first and in putting God first in our lives, we are in fact loving our family better. 
Think of it in terms of the instruction that you're given on a plane. You put your oxygen mask on first before you help put on others' oxygen masks. By loving God first, in ordering our lives the way Jesus calls us to, we are making room for others in our life to do the same. And in doing so, we are helping them to draw closer to Christ as well. In reality, when we get the order wrong, when we put our family above our love for God and God's call in our lives, it may look right at first, but it's really like those funhouse mirrors at the carnival. The proportions are off. Our lives become too fat or too skinny or too tall or too short. By putting God first, by putting love of God above our love and passion for anything else, we create order in our lives that doesn't exist otherwise. Friends, Jesus tells us in this passage that discipleship comes with a cost. But the truth is that living any other way ultimately costs us more. This is the clarion call that we receive. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And this passage from Luke and ones like it remind us that nothing, nothing can be allowed to stand in the way of our commitment to the work of God's rule in this world and in our lives. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.